Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hi, Julia. Hi, Julia. Welcome. Oh, it's so good to see you guys. Catherine and Anna, I have to tell the rest of the group my faux pas last time. I uh, did not take into account our international group here and forgot to warn them about our daylight savings time. So if you missed Catherine Anna, and Anna as much as I did last time, it's because I didn't tell them that our, our time zones had shifted by an hour. Totally my fault, guys. I'm so sorry about that. But Fine, we, we have our changing stuff, yeah. stuff too. It's stupid. <laughs> Well, hopefully, I, I, I've heard a rumor that here in the US, this is the last year we're doing daylight savings time. I'm not sure if that's true as I say that out loud, but we'll see if it actually happens. Um, so if, it, if it is uh, something we keep doing, I'll make sure to warn you guys in the future, because I know we do have folks from all over here. Um, <laughs> and you guys actually watched the video last time, and you did the workshop with us, which yeah. is so cool. Yeah. That is commitment. Yeah. I'm going to get... It was lovely. Julie, just to say, I will have to leave a little bit early because sure. we're going on our um, postponed Christmas dinner <laughs> for the practice. Oh, wonderful. Tonight. That's great. Yeah, yeah that's so, no problem. Uh, uh, this is recorded as well, and I'll, I'll send you uh, everything besides what is shared in breakout rooms yeah. is recorded. Yeah. So I'll send you that, and you can follow okay. along whenever you have And just to, to say, I see, do you see Miriam who's joining? Yes. Miriam. I'm, hi, Miriam. I, I don't know whether you, Miriam, I met for the first time yesterday, um, oh, yeah. and I'd, I'd like to welcome her to the group. Miriam, this is my daughter, Anna. This is Julia, Hello, um, Kate, Hello, and John. It's really nice to see John again. I haven't seen him for ages. Um, and Julia was uh, Miriam, myself. And do you remember Anna and Claire from the CIC January 2021, Julia? That's right. Well, anyhow. We met last night in Claire's house and Miriam joined no us way. as well. And Miriam is, is a palliative care consultant in ne near Dublin and is from Galway originally and is doing something with Columbia to do with narrative help. <laughs> Not the masters, but That's I forget awesome. Miriam, will you, will you introduce yourself? Oh, th thanks very much. I, uh, well, I, I actually did, uh, and hello everybody. It's lovely to be here. I actually did a, a weekend, um, you know, the basic workshop back in October time and just found it Great. absolutely fantastic. So I'm actually doing the, um, the digital, uh, the certificate from the University of Toronto. Oh, that's so, so cool. Oh, and uh, oh my gosh, it's just magic. I absolutely love it all together. Um, I'm all, it's finishing up, Thursday will be our last. So it's been going for four months. Yeah, the digital, so the, you know, a, a, a certificate in narrative medicine. It's just been fantastic all together. I've loved every minute. Yeah. I would love to touch base with you at some point and just to hear differences in the programs and what you guys are studying in Toronto and how it might compare to, you know, what, what we did and what John is now doing right now at Columbia. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So you, yeah. you've definitely found your people here. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to uh, talk with you more about your experience in Toronto. That sounds so cool. Yeah. It's been fantastic. Um, she said you, you, you worked in what kind of care? I'm sorry. I, I missed the first word. Palliative medicine, palliative care. Palliative, great, yeah, palliative, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I, I can't wait to, to talk with you more about your experience, especially um, how you are using narrative work in palliative care, because that's something that's very dear to my heart too. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Um, well, welcome, welcome Kate, welcome John. I'm gonna get our um, presentation up and running now, so. Go here. All right. Cool. So I think we're pretty much all here. I'm going to leave the um, participants tab open just in case we have any friends who are trying to join last minute. But I think this is pretty much everybody today. So we'll have a, a small intimate group. Um, so just to get us started, I'd love everybody to open the chat box and write just a, a sentence or so about the scenery where you're from. What? It might not be where you are right now, but where you're from originally, write a sentence or two about the scenery, what you would see if you looked outside in the town or city where you're from.
I feel like I'm taking a tour of the world right now as I'm reading all of these responses. Catherine is from the Atlantic Ocean, which I can just imagine broad and beautiful. Um, I'm from the beach. John is from a lush green valley with snow-capped mountains, miles in the distance. Mm. Wow, that sounds so picturesque. Verdant rolling hills, terracotta rooftops, sun and warmth. Ooh, I'm guessing that's California. Is that right? Is that where, you, where you're from is where you are right now, John? No, no, no. So where that is, is mm -hmm. um, that is Italy in the oh. mountains between uh, Rome and Naples. Uh, wow. It's, the province is called Molise, M-O-L-I-S-E. It's also the Abruzzi region. Um, yeah. I didn't know you were originally from Italy. I knew you were Italian, but that's amazing. Well, that's when, when you said where you're from, yeah. you didn't say where you oh, were born. You're right. And that is you're where right. I'm from. That's, Beautiful. that's my culture. That's beautiful. Yeah, I was born in New York, uh, in Westchester County, uh, which is north of New York City. But I am from there. <laughs> oh, that absolutely so, applies. Yeah. And I, yeah. I take it you have spent some time there because you, mm. you described yeah. it so eloquently. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And Miriam is from Galway, which looks across the Galway Bay to the, Bur to the Burren and across the Aran Islands in, in the Atlantic. Uh, typically, people are walking on the prom with some jumping off the diving board into the sea mm -hmm. at any time of the year. I love it. A lot of water and oceans going on in our, in our homelands. Sounds beautiful. Kate, not from any one place. So dogwood trees, gated park, green grocer, Mediterranean Sea, armed soldiers. That's so cinematic. And Anna, the wet squelchy soil, yet an unlimited palette of greens, always our poet. Anna, that's beautiful. Touch of rain every day. I can smell it and feel it all in one. Great. Thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit of the gems of your home places um, and ancestral homes with us. Um, the artwork that we're gonna look at today is artwork inspired by the artist's home place. Uh, we're going to be looking at a work by Andrew Wyeth, perhaps the most famous work by Andrew Wyeth that I'm sure a lot of us have seen before, but maybe we haven't really uh, taken a lot of time with examining it. So we'll do that together. Um, first, a little bit about Andrew Wyeth. He was an American visual artist, primarily a realist. Um, uh, working predominantly in a regionalist style. He was one of the best known artists of the middle 20th century. Um, his favorite subjects were the land and the people and the relationships between them, um, usually in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Maine. And uh, the land we're gonna look at today, the painting uh, is, uh, the landscape is of rural Maine. Uh, oh, oops, you get a little sneak peek of where we're headed. My uh, mouse is very touchy. All right. Um, uh, Wyeth often said, I paint my life, which is interesting because I was always, as I was doing a little bit of research on Wyeth, you know, he is known as the realist uh, American painter. Um, I noticed that some of his later works kind of lent themselves into the surreal. I was looking at um, a really gorgeous painting today called Dr. Sin or Dr. Sign, spelled S Y N, um, of a uh, a skeleton wearing nautical clothing, uh, looking out over um, the uh, a window from a from a, uh, a a ship, and it was just so cool. So I think he has a really wide range of what we would determine as realism. Um, as I'm saying that out loud, I'm realizing too that realism and surrealism actually don't really describe the content of the paintings themselves. They actually describe the style in which they're painted. So he does take very close attention to detail, even when he's doing something like a skeleton looking over the side of the ship, it is a very real depiction of a skeleton. Um, the painting we're gonna look at today, I invite you to look at the brush strokes and the, um, the fierce attention to the natural detail of the land and the person here and how, uh, the attempt at realism is, um, uh, it's dedicated, it's, it's an ambitious attempt at realism. Uh, his most well-known painting is Christina's World, currently in the collection of MoMA. 
So those of us who've gotten to go to MoMA might have seen this in real life. In fact, the picture that we're looking at is actually taken from MoMA. I couldn't find a better one online than the one that Alia actually took for us when she was at MoMA a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is executed in uh, temper and it's painted in 1948 when Wyeth was 31 years old, very young to be doing something so exquisite. Um, the setting is the stark landscape of coastal Maine, and the subject was the artist's neighbor, a woman named Anna Christina Olson, who discovered, or I'm sorry, who suffered from a, de a degenerative muscle condition, uh, likely polio, but it was a, a, a neuromuscular condition. Oh, Catalina's joining us. I'm going to let her jump on before we move forward. Welcome, Catalina. Hi, Julia. I Hello. Hope you, hi, I hope you weren't waiting in our waiting rooms too long. I, I just noticed that you were there. It's okay, it's okay. I'm Great. glad I'm here. Yeah. It's perfect timing. We were just about to jump into our painting. We were talking a little bit about Andrew Wyeth, uh, who's an American realist painter um, who uh, typically paints scenes from his hometown um, or his place, uh, his home places in Maine and Pennsylvania, the one we're looking at today is a painting called Christina's World. Uh, and the landscape is uh, the rural coastal landscape of Maine. And the subject here that we're about to see is a woman named Christina who suffered from a degenerative muscle condition, probably polio. So we'll go ahead and jump right into that. So we're gonna take together just, let's take a solid two minutes just to enter the space of this painting to start noti noticing its minute details, the brush strokes, the shadows, the imagery here, let it speak to us. All right, let's start out by talking a little bit about what is happening here on a high level, and then we'll zoom into the details. And if anybody would like me to literally zoom in on the painting, I can do that as well. I'll take us off of the screen share and I can open up a larger image through Google if you like. But for right now, let's zoom out and just wonder what is literally happening in this painting? And you can just speak out loud. You don't have to write in the chat box. Oh, Catherine, I think you might be on mute if you're speaking. Okay, there we go. Oh, got it. Sorry to We're call you about that. <laughs> there was still one more to say. Um, 
Well, maybe a different question to ask would be, where is the action in this painting? The foreground with the woman on the grass. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. There's that seems to be where most action is happening. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Kate. There's, I also see action in the um, angle of the main house, looking out of the painting, mm -hmm. away from what what or from Christina. Mm -hmm. And also action in the um, the track marks toward to and from the house. Yeah. So good. House looking away from Christina, whereas Christina seems to be looking at the house. Let's put a pin in that. That seems really important. And then you also notice that there's evidence of action here in the uh, the tire marks leading to or from the house. And then let's go back to our, our first observation about where a, a lot of action is actually happening in the foreground with the subject here. What is our subject doing? I guess, I guess you, you, know, you wonder, is she trying to make her way to the house or mm -hmm. is she, she looks like she's trying to move or moving. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think she's, do you think that she's trying to make her way to the house? Is she trying to get attention? Mm, maybe. She, trying to, she looks actually quite small for, for, for being so much in the foreground. She's still actually quite small and, um, um, and obviously her, her, her legs actually look quite flaccid. Um, I thought she was trying to, to get attention. Oh, so perhaps, perhaps even um, asking for help, maybe, or, or just or, getting just just calling for attention. Or, or I, mean, I, I don't know if it's as much, yeah. but actually, she, she looks like she's looking for somebody. Um, but she yeah, has, but her legs look quite flaccid. She looks, she looks quite vulnerable. Mm. Vulnerable. Let's keep going with adjectives like vulnerable that describe our subject here. What other, what other adjectives do you think would describe our subject? Well, to kind of echo Miriam, small as well. Such a great point that even though she's in the foreground, she's still actually quite small. Excellent point. Um, I, I have. Sorry, Kate. No, go ahead which is kind of delicate, like her little arm is just delicate, like, you know, like a little chicken bone almost, isn't it? Mm. Delicate, great word. Um, I see also a uh, longing, longing. Exclu exclusion or excluded. Mm -hmm. And um, how can I explain? I don't know what the adjective is, but if you block her out and just look at the rest of the painting and then unblock her, she adds, she's got a different color palette. Uh, so I, maybe, uh, I don't know what adjective that would, that would be. What's the difference in the color palette between her and the rest of the painting? <clears throat> the rest of the painting is uh, almost sepia. It's, um, mm. She's got an individual palette. Those colors are particular to her, the color of her dress, her dark hair with those little bit, that little bit of light in it. Um, so I see her as singular, a singular palette against a more generic or um, common palette of the place. A little bit of separation going on, some distance. And... Say that again, Anna? As in just um, the color, as well as perhaps the, the mood, the feeling of, of separation of that kind of to echo the longing, you know, there's a bit of um, like a lost child or something. Lost would be, yeah, I think, uh, lost or what, what, it, what is she literally doing with her hands there? With her hands. Yes, with her hands. 
one hand is kind of pushing her up and kind of uh, propping her up um, quite weakly, but trying. And then the other hand is desperately reaching a little bit. So one is supporting and the other is reaching. So connected to lost could be just loss. Loss. What is lost here? Can you tell? What is she reaching for? Home, perhaps. Maybe, Has yeah. That, that farmhouse in the distance. Mm -hmm. Let me see now if I can it's, zoom in. It Oops. surprises me that she's so far away from the farmhouse when, mm -hmm. and that she's actually put lying on um, the on the grass rather than kind of the more the, the more farmed area you know I, I imagine that grass is rougher but maybe in, um, because it's so dry and brown I imagine that grass is rougher so I'm surprised that she's put uh, on that grass rather than and then she doesn't even have a blanket under her um, <laughs> But now, now I'm now I'm going all mother. <laughs> now I'm going all mammy. <laughs> no, that's great. I think I think this painting invites us to concern. It invites us to a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, anxiety for her welfare here. I think that's absolutely a feeling I at least get as well as I look at this. And it does, of course, beg the question: How did she get out here? Mm -hmm. How is she going to get back? And you bring that's up such wondered. a has she, mm -hmm. has she fallen or fallen out of some kind of device or because it is unusual I thought that too there's no path or there's no you know it's like she's been abandoned there but how did she get there in the first place yeah well let's imagine how do you how do we think she got there let's just take some wild guesses based on evidence that we see from the painting Mm -hmm. about I don't know why I, I was thinking about the color of the house and the color of the grass and the color of her uh, dress and I, I was thinking of like an end and like uh, a last look behind with hope and something but this is this came to my mind I don't know it's so maybe instead of longing or reaching back for the house she's actually on her way away from it and then is looking back with longing yeah, I, yeah, I, something like that. The last look. Yeah. Hmm. That is interesting. I hope, like maybe there is something there, but yeah, something mm. like that. I I also think it's it's such an interesting point too that this is not the well trod path. She's not on the path that is normally taken, and she is in kind of rougher terrain here. So if she's forging her own way, she's doing it oh, as, as Kate said, uh, in a very singular way. Yeah, the, the patch of paler grass is mowed. She's out yeah. in the unmowed um, area. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not all, all, cultivated. All I'm, hearing, all I'm hearing is like metaphors in these descriptions. <laughs> for right? the kind of state that she's in. She looks so isolated there as well. <laughs> okay, so it's time. Let's let's dive in let, away <laughs> from the literal into the figurative. What do you think these are metaphors for? Go ahead, go for it, Anna. I, well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, metaphor, they're, they're hints. They're, they're, they're kind of, all of these I think are, we're teasing. We, they're things to tease out. So obviously I don't know, but um, there's, like a terrible sense of that longing but that isolation kind of overwhelming like i think the vast space you know obviously it's very spacious and there's nothing there but it's almost like overwhelming her body language tells me there's some like exhaustion there and mm. she's overwhelmed and the kind of big open space is just so big <laughs> um i haven't gone into any meaning here but just that kind of separation or that distance is kind of strong to me yeah exhaustion distance exclusion somebody else mentioned i think all of that is here and could perhaps relate to 
her her lived experience of a of a degenerative condition that we see in the painting even without that uh, context that the author gives us about her potentially having had polio we can see in her arms and in her hair even um looks like a this looks like somebody who would have a, a tough time making it all the way out here on her own. And yet she has, and yet she has, yeah. you know, I, I have, I think I have to add to our list of vulnerable, small, delicate, longing, excluded. I think I have to add strong or brave or something else here. I mean, the end yet she has is what, what really drives this painting for me. I think she has real dignity. Yeah. Like despite her struggle, she's there's something really beautiful and dignified about her. I think she's beautiful. Yes. And yeah, there is a strength. I think you're right, Julia. Yeah. Part of that strength for me comes from the fact that we can't see her face. Ooh, we see um we're seeing her intention, her energy, her spirit almost what's, you know, what's driving her. We're not seeing like the distraction of um, the features of her face, of who she is in particular. It makes it, for me, the painting is about uh, whatever struggle she's in. It's about that struggle for all of us, um, not just about this particular individual. Let's, that's such a brilliant observation that I want to pair it with your last brilliant observation, Kate, uh, that her color palette is, is kind of individual and singular, whereas the outside is sepia. So what does this tell us if, if she is in this painting, that she does stand out from the background, at least in a the sense of color in, in several more ways. She does stand out and yet what we see of her is not her face or her physical particularity, but her intention, her drive, her energy. What do you, what do you make of this, uh, you, using that contrast between the landscape and her, her particular color palette? What does this tell us about her experience? How do we how do we read her particularity when she is also not particular? Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, yeah, I under I does okay, for me. Great. great. Um, I have thoughts about that, but I feel like I've been blabbing a lot. So, please keep it coming. Um, well, this is just linked to my own experience. I live with somebody who is. Um, disabled mm -hmm. and part of his adjustment to that um, disability is the feeling of being stripped of his identity um, or every all the ways in which he felt he knew himself before the, the injury that resulted in the disability so when I look at this painting I'm seeing this person in a sense stranded uh, on the one hand, she's wearing her dress, her particular dress with her hair done her particular way and her belt and her color scheme. And on the other hand, she's stranded outside this, that circle, that paler circle of um, uh, mowed, mowed land where the farmhouse is and the barn and all the things that are contained in that, that the fence, even all of that is how we know how to live. And what's outside of that where she is, the space she occupies, is the place where we all have to go back to, to ground zero. Who the hell am I? And how do I get back in? How do I connect to um, some sense of structured existence? Gorgeous. I don't know if that was your question, but that's my answer. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Just to dovetail on that, that beautiful reflection. Um, it makes me think of the word sepia that you used in the landscape around as a romanticization of that lost life too. You know, a, 
um, almost uh, seeing what was lost as something that is more ideal than perhaps it even was too. Because that this, this landscape is quite idyllic to me as, as I'm looking at this. This is the, you know, the, the idyllic main farmhouse. Um, and I think that for me, when I think of the word sepia or the color sepia, I think of something that is uh, almost nostalgic in an unreal way too. So I, thank you so much for sharing the story um, of the one you live with with the disability and how it's so hard to reckon with your identity and your past when things are so different and, and to wonder how do I get back in? I think it's such a fantastic point. Does anyone else have thoughts on that? So the sepia kind of makes me feel or think about, as you said, nostalgia or thinking back or maybe perhaps something that's in the past, something older. Right? And so um, the one thing that really struck me about her. No, you want to do this or outside? No. Okay, so the one thing that really struck me about um, the subject's positioning in the foreground mm -hmm. is um, if you look at the way her feet were pointed, they're pointed away from the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think that perhaps she was heading in a direction, voluntarily or involuntarily, we could think about metaphors for illness, about loss that is something that is not wanted. Um, and so she may have been turning with a longing towards home and perhaps fallen into the position that she's in. Looking back on an older scene of what she thought maybe was home um, and realizing that she can't get there anymore. You which wouldn't is, go. Which is very often what, what? You know, what people experience with illness. You know, there's a there's a line in the sand, a pr proverbial line in the sand that we remember home in a very sapia, picturesque kind of way. Mm. But we can't really ever get back to where that was because of our illness, our injury, our change, you know, the change that was imposed on us by illness or injury. So just some thoughts that occur to me while I'm looking at this. It's quite complex and quite beautiful and quite, quite as Anna said, uh, the metaphors are huge. There's a lot to read, so. John, I, I know this is taking us a little bit away from the close reading, but, uh, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but does this painting resonate with uh, your work or the work that you, you once did for, um, uh, for folks in the military? Hmm. Well, um, so we haven't spoken in a minute. Uh, so I'm in a different, uh, I'm working in acute care medicine now in mm -hmm. another hospital. Um, yes. And so uh, this is this is quite relevant to what I perceive and from what I so to answer your question, yes, and it is it is quite prevalent in what I'm doing now as well. Uh, th this kind of metaphor of um, of loss uh, and loss that was not um, not something that was ever part of a plan. And how do I now, based upon this loss, how do I now find home? Where is home? Who yes. am I? Yes. So yes, to answer your question, yes. Very much Where so. Where is home? 
very much so. Really I feel struck, like, oh, go ahead, please. No, 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 really struck me, Julia. Um, and it took me a while to see and think about her body position and her feet. That was really, really um, meaningful to me that she perhaps had been walking down that track and walking away from home to, for whatever, to explore life, right? Away from home as we maybe all do, right? As young people, because she looks quite young. And so she may have been heading in a direction when she was struck down and is turning with a longing, perhaps almost uh, uh, questioning, what, what have I done? Where, where, where has this taken me? Where, I, can't, I can't ever get back. Can I ever get back there? These are, these are questions I've heard from, from patients. Patient. Yeah. So it's neat to think about that. There is so much brilliance to unpack there that I kind of want to take it piece by piece. So first you point us to a question and I think all great artwork is driven by questions that are wrestled with and perhaps never actually answered, but really wrestled with. And one of those questions is clearly for me, as I, as I listen to your close reading, where is home? Where is home? How do I get back there? Such a powerful question driving this painting. And, and I love how you've also, you've honed in on her posture, which now I, I can't unsee as ambivalent in the true sense of the word as being torn in two directions, lower half of the body, literally from that, that line of the belt down, have once once move moving in one direction and then the top half twisting back looking back the other so there's the torn quality um, of what Kate called that energy that desire that intention is torn into different directions um, and I love that you've also you've pointed out that this may not be a literal as much of a realist uh, project this is this may actually be a psychological landscape. Yeah. This might be the inner world of Christina as she's walking away from this house, headed in a direction, maybe as a healthy young, young woman, and then struck down by, by life. And now she's trying to figure out how to, how to get back. Where do I go now? Where is home? Um, thank you for pointing out all of these wonderful observations. Um, I, I have a, a question that might might take us in a different direction as well. Um, we've been talking a lot about the metaphor of loss here. Does anybody else, or does anybody see this differently as a metaphor for something other than loss? Something other mm -hmm. than um, longing or exclusion? She has some grass in her hair. And I was thinking like, a short sleep after and then not knowing who I am, where I where am I going? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's, um, but I think it's still connected to the, the word lost. Still mm. questions about identity and about yes. Belonging to something. I feel like um to go to kind of parallel to this feeling of loss and lost and, and all these things there's a sense of her own like personal unique trajectory in life her very own journey with all this kind of what we're talking about with all its ups and downs and its distance and its uniqueness and its isolation from the rest of perhaps normality or conventional life but it's her own um and there's hesitation and there's doubt if she's doing the right thing for herself or and and so on but um, and to go with the color of the background being very monochrome and same and not ordinary, relatively ordinary, just with what we are discussing and compared to her, <clears throat> she's the most striking piece of the, of mm -hmm. the image, you know, she's, she's the brightest, but also the darkest with her hair, but, um, and there's a sense of light and unliveliness in her, despite the spirit in her despite um kind of disabilities. disabilities and despite kind of situations that it looks like she's in you know it looks like she's fallen but perhaps she's the own she's the spark and she's kind of 
the thing that can make choices and turn either way. And you know, so I see, I see a journey here. I see her own individuality and and kind of strength in that. Yeah. To to piggyback on that, she's the only life form in this picture. There are no animals, no stage hands. I'm um, stage hands, farm hands. Um, there's no other. There's not a red little ladybug. There's nothing else alive in this. You know, even the grass is alive. <laughs> no, it's a time of year when the grass, right? The grass is <laughs> straw. Yeah. So that speaks to her, like Anna was saying, to her her strength and her vitality. And yeah, the more I think about it, I think you know, initially, Mike, you know, Mike, I was wondering how she got there, but I, I think just going thinking about what John was saying and just the general theme. I, I think this is more a surreal thing that she's yeah. being put there in this mm. picture. Like, really, to be honest, there's no possible way I can see that she would have been there, you know, <laughs> from there. a practical point of view. You know, she can't, she couldn't have walked. I mm. don't see a wheel. She wouldn't have had a wheelchair. She would have had calipers in those days, you know. So I don't think that she's actually been a bad, you know, she hasn't been fallen off something and been left there. I think she was placed there by the artist in a kind of surreal way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to go with Catalina with the straw in the hair, that's a really interesting detail. And it gives a sense of, I don't know, I, I, not dreamlike, but, but something a little bit more um, higher up than, than like darkness and heft and stuff. So a youth to her. And she's something. woken up to this as well, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Maybe she's literally woken up here. Yeah. Since the straw in the hair. Yeah. I can see personally with the surreal element, I guess not, it's kind of just a random observation, but uh, to me, if this painting was moving, mm -hmm. I would see the house and the shed and everything in the distance getting further and further away. Mm -hmm. It's really like a dream, like, it's a dream within a dream yeah. or something that John was saying and with the Catalina, if she woke up and it was still moving away from her, you know, if, if there yes. was motion, there would be that and it would be kind of scary and panicky, but, yes. but um, you know. Yes, that. and it brings us full circle to a, a point I believe Kate made at the beginning that the house is looking away from her too. So mm -hmm. as it's moving away, it's looking away, its intentions are away and you, you feel that uh, you feel the distance yeah in a in an almost surreal way yeah. you know like like looking at a Dali painting where you feel things slow down with time you know here you feel the distance almost increasing mm. I Some wonder the, uh, oh sorry go ahead Julia please I'm just very interested in that in that building that's on the horizon right above her head yes the the angle at which that is captured, there, there's no, um, we don't see the roof. It almost looks like a child's representation of a barn. There's no uh, sh shading on it. And I can't quite figure out what that, what that adds, you know, I've tried blocking it out and then letting it come back in. What is that doing there? So a I roofless know building. I don't know if I'm going to complicate that or help anything, but I've been thinking a lot about it too. And if you look at the slope of its, I guess I won't call it a roof, it, it, not, if we're not sure if it has one, but the, the slope of its top part matches the slope of the curve of her waist, almost identically, the same curve, mm -hmm. and it's directly in line with her. And it, if we look at the windows and doors as eyes, I mean, it doesn't seem to have very many, but you do see two small openings there facing her. So it's almost, there's almost a parallel. If the, if the farmhouse is not looking at her and it seems to be moving away, for me, as I look at that one building in the center, just like her, same parallel line, same slope facing her direction, I I see it. I see a symmetry, and I don't know what to do with it. What do you guys think? It also it parallels. Depends. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead, Catalina. Saying that it is out of the yard of the fence of the other building. It's yes. 
Good yeah. point. It's not fenced in like the other, like the farmhouse is. Yeah. And it uh, it speaks to John's observation about her body. The one one roof line, the the roof line on the left is um, a different angle and shape and length from the one on on the right. Just like her body is angled in two different ways, the upper mm -hmm. body and the lower body. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with this symmetry that we're noticing? How, do, how does this help us understand anything about this painting in a new way on a figurative level? Or what, is, what do you think it means? Oh, sorry, my costume was just kind of leaving there. So I kind of can't, I don't know where we are at the moment <laughs> talking about symmetry. Yes, so we're noticing that the, this, okay, so first we should ask, what kind of building is this? We've got the farmhouse on the upper right, and then we've got a building in the center that's kind of off a ways. Uh, it's got, we've noticed it has a lot of similarities with our, uh, the woman in the foreground, you know, this, the yeah. curve of the roof, the, uh, the way it seems to be moving in two different directions, um, that it's kind of, it's facing her dead on. And yet it's kind of got this surreal, like roofless quality to it, that it doesn't, it doesn't look as linear as the other house. Um, it's in the same parallel line as our subject in the, in the foreground. So what do we do with this weird symmetry between that building and the woman and I maybe one place to start would be to wonder what kind of building is this does anybody does anybody know about farm life in rural Maine what what, what this building might be it looks like a barn or a shed or a yeah you know a store even storage or something storage like that. yeah like grain storage something like that what else John go for it well you know pointing out um the things that I noticed about it as well um, really no windows or doors formally, mm -hmm. um, no roof. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it might not be a newer structure or a structure that was under construction or destruction in some way. That was just yeah. a question that came to mind. Is it, is it, is it old? Is it falling down? Is it an old house that is no longer inhabited? Is it an old barn? Or is it new? Are they, or is that new construction? Are walls being put up? Does a roof have to go on it still? Just mm -hmm. questions. Those yeah. questions help me a lot. Yeah. Because it helps. It doesn't, to oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Please, Catalina. I was just saying maybe it doesn't need a roof. A roof is something which is, you know, stopping something from, I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's I was also, looking at, yeah, sorry. No, no, Catalina, you weren't done, go ahead. No, yeah. And I was just saying that the base of the building is very strong, it's very mm -hmm. large, is. It, it like has a, depth, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has quite a good shadow on it, so it has depth, it's, it's a, a sturdy building. Yeah, real, yeah. The absence of windows or doors, you know, it could just be this angle, it could be the doors are on the other side, mm -hmm. but it does present as a building that's not a habitation, it's not a place for people to live, it's not where people live. It's mm -hmm. got some other function, it's a util utility building or uh, something else. So as I'm listening to you guys describe this building, all I can think is, that for me, this is becoming more and more a symbol of potential. Oh. This building is, uh, you know, perhaps it's a place for storage. Maybe there are doors on the other side of it that we can't see. Maybe the roof hasn't been built yet. Is, is it old? Is it new? It's a place of potential that's almost like a placeholder is the wrong word. I was going to Working say a progress. What's that? Work in progress? Yes, absolutely. And it also seems to ask a question as you as you 
uh, uh, put it earlier, John, you know, is this an old structure or is it new? It just, that resonates with everything that you were saying before about where is home? Am, am I going to choose this old one or am I going to make something new with this? What am I gonna put in this? How am I gonna use this? You know, what's interesting, Julia, as well, the side of the main farmhouse mm -hmm. that is facing our subject in the foreground has no windows or doors either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, in the, in the farmhouse on the right. Correct. Yeah. No one can see her. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that just, I just yeah. kind of noticed that as well, that. Yeah. Everything facing her is blocked. Yeah, it all faces away. Seems, and seems yet, like, yeah, seems closed off in some way. There's a tiny little square at the top of the building that is that mm -hmm. we're calling a storage building, mm -hmm. which for me signals just a little bit of hope. <laughs> uh -huh. Just a little bit of being seen. And maybe she's not looking at it, right? Like she she doesn't see that she could perhaps be seen there i'm starting to think of this as our artist's vantage point <laughs> so they're from from the reverse but oh there's so many places i want to go here we could talk about this forever and i know we have to get into our writing um there's it was there's just please catalina just to say, I, I was thinking about the fact that if she would turn with the mm -hmm. face from uh, uh, to us it's a valley so she would like you know uh, the gravity will bring her in this way. I don't know. I, I get. I have the feeling that if she turns back, she would just uh, run away from the from the painting. You know, like. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Let's it's... let's finish up by talking about that, Catalina, because that is that's the elephant um, in the room of this painting for me. Is that she is turned away from the viewer, and we've had one really great interpretation of that being a way for us to see her energy and her intention uh her drive without um the particularity of her which actually makes this a much more um expansive painting that you know anybody with a disability can really see themselves in i also wonder anytime i see a painting of somebody's back of the back of somebody's head who who here did uh, eugenie lee's attached to my adhesion with me i know john john did anna did that's another one where we see the back of somebody's head looking mm -hmm. forward it's always such an interesting device to use because it, for me, it makes me think who's behind me as a viewer. It puts me, it, it makes me wonder what I can't see, what are in my blind spots, what can I see that she can't, what can she see that I can't. Yeah. So it really pulls perspective to the foreground of our uh, uh, close reading, um, makes us wonder about our own perspective. Yeah. which I know this is not really a question, it's more of just a, a, a comment, but it makes me think too that our, that Andrew Wyeth was not a disabled person. And yet he's painting about the lived psychological landscape, perhaps, of somebody who is disabled. So how does that change how we close read this painting, knowing that we can't see exactly what she sees. And knowing even that the painter himself, as he's painting this, cannot possibly see what is going on in her inner landscape. How does it change the way we close read this at all? Go for it, John. So I wonder if, I wonder if anybody else is, um, is thinking about 
if they found themselves in this exact position right behind our subject in the foreground in the painting, what would they do? I, I, I have, I, in my perspective, what I would, what I would do if I came across this scene in my backyard, uh, I might first, my first inclination is to say, hey, are you all right? Because I don't know what she's doing there. Mm -hmm. And so, and I don't, I don't know if maybe she wants to be exactly where she is. Mm -hmm. Perhaps she doesn't, but until I can find out her intentions, uh, I am not going to assume that she is in distress or she is happy or she is sad or she is anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think your point brilliantly illustrates a metaphor for life that perspective. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting to be in a position where we we make our own interpretations of what we see, yet we have no idea what this other person is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And isn't that, isn't that, I, I, I reckon that that's something that I don't often, you know, I have to consciously um, stay in tune with because mm -hmm. she may not need help at all. She mm -hmm. may be fine. So anyway, I'll shut up because I have a lot to say, but I won't. <laughs> That was great. That was great. It makes me think that just as we were talking about that building, perhaps the storage shed, as being a container for, for possibility, for mutability change, just as that is a, a placeholder for possibility in our painting, the painting also invites us to leave space for possibility too, because we don't know what she is seeing. So we as viewers have to remember, no matter how cleverly we close read this, we have to leave space for multiple interpretations until we can jump into that painting and ask her ourselves, right? And what I always hope you guys take away from these workshops is not that we can close read people like we do paintings or poems or songs, because artworks, um, they exist in a finite period of time and they give us the luxury of really diving in to this textual present and asking these great questions and seeing lots of different you know, possibilities for interpretation um, that, we, that we honor by not closing down. And yet when we are talking with real people, we have the opportunity, the gift of, asking them, you know, are, am I getting this right? You know, tell me about your experience. It's more of an exchange. So this practice helps us tune into details, but it's not, it's not how we should interact with other people, you know, listen to their stories, tell them what we think it means given, you know, our clever close readings and then walk away feeling like great close readers, right? Like, uh, um, I think John so wisely puts it that, you know, we don't, we make interpretations, but we don't really know. And so the painting invites us too to leave space for possibility for multiple different intention, intentions to, to exist and coexist within the space of this painting. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I, any last thoughts before we move on to, oh, please, please, yes, go for it, Miriam. Actually, I, I found the talk quite uncomfortable. Us, um, but um, but I have to say I found what you said there, Julia, very helpful. Of the idea of kind of the sight, um, that it's not actually through her lens, that it's through someone else's lens, and uh, um, uh, so I actually found that quite uncomfortable, um, because it's kind of a little bit of othering, um, mm -hmm. a, little, a little bit of othering, um, um, yeah. but actually, uh, um. I do find it very helpful in terms of uh, looking back and saying, well, this is what I'm looking at this, but it may actually not be what the, what the person is experiencing. So it's about leaving that space and, and listening to them. So I, I found that a very helpful way to, 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 to close it down. 
Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Miriam. Just to second that. Oh, please, Catalina. I was just wondering, isn't it what we are interpreting? Inter the interpretations we are doing aren't uh, saying something about us more than the ones we are interpreting. Precisely. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that no. that it. I think that acknowledging that is imperative. And and that's with that everything in life. No, knowing that you know every interpretation and judgment you make in some way reflects your lived experience of the world. You don't get away from that. We're human, you know, we take that lens and that bias with us, but acknowledging it more and more is such a great practice. Nor should we stop looking for the details in other people's stories and wondering about what it means. But when we have, when in real life, when we can engage with somebody, we have that gift of sharing stories and asking for for their interpretation too so thank you guys so much i you know i i find it so wonderful and lovely that we had we started out with a our adjectives to describe our subject were vulnerable small delicate longing excluded lost loss and slowly as we close read we also saw space for many other characteristics to emerge, uh, sturdy, deep, real, um, uh, striking, bright, alive, strong, vital, placed, and purposeful. Um, so I, I think already in our close reading, we are working on that plurality, on that, that scope of, of potential here. So thank you guys so much for bringing all of your wisdom to this painting. I learned so much just by listening to your interpretations. Any last thoughts before we move to a close reading? Or I'm sorry, to, a, to our writing, creative writing? Okay, great. Oh, just to underscore your points, as I was looking for a better online version of this painting that I could zoom in and out on and not something that we just snapped at MoMA, um, I found lots of versions of this painting where disability is erased. Wow. For the sake oh. of beauty. I have nothing to say about that other than there it is. Um, and there are lots of these out there. So I just think it's an interesting thing to think about um, that for the sake of beauty, disabilities are erased and why and how that changes fundamentally anything that made this painting special. <laughs> That's a whole, that's a whole other hour of the Zoom workshop. <laughs> right? I, I know. I know. I, I hesitated even putting this on here because I'm like, we could talk about this for hours. Um, but I just wanted to share that with you because I found it very interesting. Interesting, yeah. Great. Oh, pay no attention. All right. So next we are going to move into our writing prompt. Um, everybody bring out a piece of paper. I'm going to time us for five minutes. We're going to free write. You guys know the drill. Just get words on the page. Don't worry about them being good words. Um, I'm going to give you two possible prompts. So before I start the timer, I'll give you guys a, a, few, a few seconds to think about which prompt you want to do, because I know that's the first big hurdle. Um, here are our two choices. Prompt number one, what are you reaching for? Or prompt number two, consider a neighbor's world. So take a few seconds, think about what you wanna tackle. All right, ready, set, go, five minutes. And if you can put your... You just muted yourself, Julia. What was, if you can, what was the last comment? That's really funny because my comment was, if you can, please mute yourselves. <laughs> just in case you have background noise, I jumped the gun. All right, go for it, y'all.
All right, friends, whenever you're ready, you can drop your pencils. Great. And you can signal when you're done just by looking up at the screen and I'll know everyone's done. <clears throat> All right, groovy. So I'm gonna ask for one volunteer to read theirs out loud to the group. You can just raise your hand if you wanna be that person. Oh, John, that was a fake out. I thought you were raising your hands. <laughs> if you need me to read, I can. I just would rather let uh, anybody else read. I, I hate being somebody that talks all the time. Sorry. You do not talk all the time, John. Would you like to be our reader? We would love that. Anybody else burning to read? Seriously. Yeah. Great. So, all right. Yay. John is going to read. While he reads, we are going first for his first read through. We're just going to listen, let it wash over us for a second read through. We're going to start writing down the details that really spark our attention. Whenever you're ready, John, go for it. Okay. Uh, so, I chose what are you reaching for? Reaching, seeking, striving for or against, towards or away. I have begun journeys using neither as my guide consciously. In moving away, was I also moving towards unconsciously? My head, my heart, or my feet leading the way? I sought residence, sorry, I sought resonance within the self, reckoning, solace, unity between living and feeling. Beautiful. Stream of consciousness, just kind of. It. It's like a poem. You want to read it one more time, and this time we'll write down the words and phrases that call to us. Reaching, seeking, striving, for or against, towards or away. I have started journeys Using, using neither as my guide consciously. In moving away, was I also moving towards unconsciously? My head, my heart, or my feet leading the way? I sought resonance within the self, reckoning, solace, unity between living and feeling. Beautiful, thank you so much, John. What words, images strike you as you listen? Uh, I'm so, thank you, John, for sharing. I'm so interested in the embodiment of searching in the way it's written reaching, seeking, striving, as though that the meaning of that term is even being whittled away by each word that you put on the page, or is it for or against? Is it towards or away? Uh, I feel the searching spirit in that. And then um, I, I, the first time you read it, you said, I sought residence, and then you corrected to, I sought resonance, but I thought resonance and residence were such an interesting <laughs> It was such an interesting slip of the tongue. They both worked very, very well. Um, and then the, the final thing that struck me was such an unusual, for me, pairing of reckoning and solace. I, I see reckoning as um, turbulence, uh, questioning, um, and solace as a quiet or calm state. So very, very interesting to think about 
how or why you would have put those two things together. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thanks for your comments. That was that was really interesting. So just uh, Kate, just to two seconds. I'm wearing Invisalign, okay? So um, they often make pronouncing quite uncomfortable. Um, you know, I trip on my tongue all day long at work. It's hysterical. Um, so <laughs> it is really interesting that you pointed that out because after I read through the first time, as I stumbled on resonance, so I sought, you know, a, a, a resounding... Um, feeling in my bones right and in, in, you know something that resonated with me but it came out as residents and i thought well yeah that actually kind of does work so <laughs> so interesting thanks for that that was cool anna were you going to say something in reply um well i mean just carrying on i found all the opposites and contrasts like reckoning and the saws and stuff yes. they're all opposites yet they they couldn't have worked together better in terms of where you were going where you were reaching to like it seemed like they had to be both there in order to take you further or take you somewhere you know pulling back and going forward was what you had to do and you couldn't just you couldn't leave out one you know it seemed like that kind of journey you know we all take journeys and we do two sides of the same coin all the time <laughs> you know even if we're trying to avoid the other thing it, you know we both we, just, we always do dual things you know so it's, it's just they both you know striking that contrasting things are comrades things that go together Anna thank you for helping me put words around something I was thinking about too you said it so much more beautifully than I could have but I was also <laughs> entranced by the, the seeming opposites, you know, the for, against, tore it away, conscious, unconscious, living, feeling, and now even reckoning and solace. And I, I felt that, and that torn, that same ambivalence that we saw in the painting. Um, but I love how you sit you, and you, you're, you're so right. They both have to be there. So when we get to that final word, what, of what we're seeking on this journey, it's unity right? It's like having them both there together. So I, I completely see that in, uh, in John's writing, that this searching spirit is acknowledging that, you know, I, I often hear duality and I think of it as bad. <laughs> I think of it as like, you know, something to be overcome. Um, but this makes me think of it as something where, where both are necessary for a journey to continue. Um, yeah, I love that so much. Any any other thoughts? It's like being conscious of the unconscious and, you know, like putting the, the things like uh, knowing about what this amb ambivalent, it's not ambivalent because as you said, it's like, um, like uh, I cannot find the word in English, like a total, you know, like, something like that, like alternatives, like it's it's not only uh, going in a straight direction, but we need to search and doing this search, we are becoming more aware about where to go and uh, it, go, it takes us to exactly that unity between living and feeling. It felt, it felt like even if it, at, at the first uh, sight, it looked like being very like searching and but in the end, it's like a strategy of like, like a potential of this is what I resonate with. Mm -hmm. Sorry for my English. I don't know what is going on. Oh. Every time when I'm here, I am just losing it. That absolutely You're, makes sense. You're fantastic. No, thank you so much. And because what I'm hearing from what you're saying and what I'm feeling after reading this a few times and listening to the group and thank you all for your kind words. I guess I, 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 I'm, I'm what's coming from my own writing to me right now that I, I mean, I just wrote a few minutes ago, but I guess what I'm trying to say is balance mm -hmm. in a word, right? And so you express that really, really nicely. And, and I think several of you have 
uh, talked about the, the duality, the parallels. So that's really interesting because I didn't, you know, I, I, if I read the prompt and thought, well, what am I reaching for? Balance. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that resonates. But, you know, the stream of consciousness didn't take me there initially. So the group kind of helped tease that out. Thank you. That's really, really powerful. And your words, uh, Katarina, Catalina, are <laughs> perfect. Oh my God. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, John. So we're going to move into some breakout rooms now. Um, I know we're running short on time, so we're going to go over by like three or four minutes, if that's okay. Um, so for our breakout rooms, we're just going to have 10 minutes today. We're going to do five minute shares each. So um, what we're going to do is so you'll have 10 minutes total in breakout room. I'm going to put uh, Kate and Miriam in one room together. <laughs> 